Let's talk about chapter four, monitoring and detecting security breaches. So when you're monitoring a network, there's four types of useful data that work for DNS servers, logs, network flow, packet data, and application level metadata. And these all give you different kinds of information and applies to things more than just DNS too. So log data is the most obvious. Each product has logs it creates, recording what it does to some extent. And so it can record things like malformed queries with errors in them, um, lame delegations, which are attempts to refer to another server which it cannot reach for some reason, people that do queries for domains that don't exist and get told you don't get an answer. These are things that can go wrong. Uh, bind has a configuration file called named.conf where you determine what it should log. There are various options here. You can log errors. You can log various things. You can choose how many things to log. And the more things you log, the more it slows down your server. So production servers often prefer to have minimal logging to make them go fast. Uh, one of the tiny times my servers got hacked, there was a guy that hacked it and I couldn't figure out how he was doing it. And I finally um, turned on forensic logging in Apache. So it logged every request and every reply, and that way I was able to find out how he was hacking me, but that's expensive, that slows down your server. And the same thing, especially on DNS servers, they really don't like full query logging in a production server because it slows it down. So here's various things you can log. Uh, the channel is things like uh, files and standard error. You can record versions, severity of logs like critical or information or warning or error, and you can determine um, control what's printed to the log. But queries are probably the most important thing. These are requests that come in to resolve a domain at your DNS server. And so you'll have the client IP number and ports. You know who's asking the question. You'll have what they asked for, what type and class of query. And then you'll know what's happening. So uh, you'll see a record here of what a query looked like. So here's the date and time it came in. They asked for an information record from this person at that port asking for the A, the IP version 4 address, for example, .com. So that's the sort of thing you'll see. And the point is, if somebody's doing some kind of attack on your server, you'll see all these queries coming in, many queries from the same IP address in a short period of time, that sort of thing. All right, and then there's security. Um, requests that are denied or rejected by security controls like access control lists, um, those are always logged. That's important. Anybody trying to do something that they're denied is very strongly indicating some kind of abuse, and you want to log that. Uh, then there's um, requests to update the zone data dynamically, which would be um, an attempt to change the data. And if somebody is trying to do that who is not authorized, that's really bad. So that's the thing to know. Um, and DNSSEC is what I mentioned a few times. This is the new security uh, add-on to DNS, which if configured adds cryptographic signatures to everything so it actually knows who is giving it information and whether they're authorized to give you that information. So it adds a lot of security for issues like cache poisoning at the expense of having large cryptographic signatures flying around all the time, which create extra traffic and burden on the servers. So here's DNSSEC examples. Um, here's a DNS key error. The DNS key, something's wrong with it. Um, DNS key starting attempting positive validation. I think the DNS key worked here, but the point is there were just DNS key logs. You were, you were recording these cryptographic processes, which in this case it was successful, and you might not log it, but uh, people would typically log it if you turned on a new feature like DNSSEC just so you can check and make sure it's working properly. And so here's zone transfers, a transfer in and a transfer out, and those will be logged. And those are important too, because you know you don't want zone transfers going to someone who is not authorized. And then, so that's logs created by the DNS server. Then there's packet data, where you just record the packets on the network. Typically, to do this, you need a span port on a switch, or more likely, a network tap a special hardware device that sends an extra copy of every packet to a monitoring device. This is a very important network security measure, but the problem is it's a lot of data. The total amount of data flowing around in your network is very large. If you actually record all the packets, then it greatly helps your forensic analysts and instant response teams with a lot of data, but it's also a lot of expense to archive all that data. So it's an issue. Anyway, you, you pick it up usually with uh, WinPCAP on a Windows machine or uh, TCP dump on a Linux machine. 
And then there's network flow data. Now this started primarily with Cisco, and the point of this was to figure out how much to charge you for service on a network. And it's, it's like your telephone pen register that records who you called and where they were and for how long. This gives a summary of a network connection, source and destination IP, port and protocol, and maybe how many packets went. This was originally developed by Cisco and is now considered IP flow information export is the official standard format for this kind of data. And so it will have um, an entire TCP session from the handshake, all the transfer to the end with a reset or fin will be considered one flow and have one line. So you don't get all the contents, you just get who's been talking to who. Now UDP traffic does not have a handshake or a fin, so it has to sort of guess how many packets are included in one flow, and it's not perfect. And so you'll have something like this, um, one IP address going to another IP address, some port numbers, and then some numbers here. I think these are timestamps, and this is the either port numbers or total amount of data transferred, that sort of thing. So that's where it is. So this is a router name, source IP, destination IP, then number of packets transferred is 171, 83, 13, that's bytes. Then the timestamp of beginning and end, then source and destination ports, and then a representation of flags and protocol numbers. So that's what you get. One record recording something like a whole download. They connected to something and downloaded something. All right. And then application level metadata is information about the activity of your server at a high level, um, choosing usually not including things like IP addresses and such. So here's the kind of thing you might have. It'll keep some fields and not others. So this has the domain, um, the, res the result, the time, and the number of responses, this sort of thing. So you get one flow. You configure it to store only certain data about each item. And this is often the most useful, if carefully designed. It gives you just the facts as opposed to something like a whole bunch of packets you have to hunt through to find things. But since it doesn't have a whole lot of data, you might find the data you need is not there. Anyway, those are the four types of logging that are used. Let's try another Kahoot, which would be, all right, somehow I don't have the Kahoots. Let's get them up again. Can't see the login, there it is, okay, good. Right. Library, favorites, crunch them together. All right. And now I want 4A, which is here. Good. And I have no idea what the advanced mode is. Classic works. Everybody's always adding new features, and I usually don't care. Got everybody that's coming. All right. So, what kind of data uses the IP fix standard? That's NetFlow, to give you one line of data for every network transfer on the network.
right, what kind of data is controlled by named.conf? Name D is name daemon. It's the executable for ISC bound, the most popular DNS chip. All right, that is um, the configuration file determines what bind will log. All right. What kind of data do you get at a span port? That's packets. By the way, in the previous one, some people answered application-level metadata in named.conf, and I realized I don't know where you go to get that application-level name data. It might be in named.conf. I don't actually know how to do that. It'd be good to throw that in the projects, but I don't have it yet. Anyway, a span port gives you raw packets. And what log entry shows that someone collected your bind data with his own transfer? A transfer out means somebody transferred the data out of your DNS server. A transfer in would be data coming in, and you certainly don't want either of those happening to unauthorized people, especially in. That would be bad. All right. All right. What kind of data protects the privacy of your users by excluding IP addresses? That's the metadata. The metadata example we had excluded addresses. And that is one reason why you would do that, to prevent uh, exposing the IP addresses of your users. All right, Woot. I know who that is. And JF. I don't know who that is, although it might be that those are real initials. It might be enough for my data to find you. And Jump Food John. All right, so I've recorded those. Go back to the slides here. All right, so, all right, so to detect attacks, um, cache poisoning means they'll be sending many, many replies with different transaction IDs and source ports trying to get it. Um, so, first they make a request for a record that is not cached. Your server then asks some other server, where is it? And now I try to race in and get the wrong answer in before your server gets the right answer. So, uh, flow records. It will look like this, um, source destination, port, source and destination, times, number of bytes. So here's a possible cache poisoning attack, and the reason is going to be um, just many, many replies. Uh, so this destination port went to 53, that was sending request. Here's a reply from a source port of 53 coming into 1024. This is trying to be a reply, and I just have many, many replies here coming in. Um, from the same IP address. So one query gives you a whole flood of replies from one server, which is going to turn out not to be a real authoritative, real DNS server, and that's a clue that I'm undergoing a cache poisoning attack. All right, so the flow records don't have the DNS request, and you can't pinpoint the domains being targeted or the addresses being injected, so that's a limitation of flow records. They only have the addressing information, none of the high-level information. All right, so DNS requests are typically irrelevant. A request doesn't do any harm. The only thing it could possibly do is slow down your server by having a lot of requests, but it's not much harmful. Replies are what kind of performs the poisoning. So uh, you'd like to have the uh, source and destination IP. You'd like to have the question and the answer, the transaction ID, the timestamp, and so on. This is a lot of good information. This is what they need to perform the attack. 
They need to spoof or guess all that information. Now, another issue is people have domains that change very often. A typical domain, an IP address does not change very often. You get a server, you use that server for months or years. All that time, the IP address doesn't change. So you configure your DNS records to have a lifetime of like six hours or something, and then it only requeries your server every six hours to refresh the cached data. That's normal, but you can make it so that your domain expires in a really short amount of time and you can keep changing the IP address. And this is something you would normally do because you're malicious and you're hiding it on servers that you've hacked and you keep getting kicked off and having to go to another server as people detect your attack and clean it up. So uh, things like botnet controllers or malware downloads or file drop sites. So you look for DNS traffic with small time to live records. That's uh, if you have one record with a small time to live, it might be that it's just about to expire, but if it's repeatedly and all small, that means that, configure, that server is configured to constantly expire and that it's suspicious. All right. Round robin DNS is one version. And by the way, we can see this at Microsoft. Let me give it a try live here. If I, Microsoft has round robin DNS, which is of course not malicious. So if I do a dig, a, a Microsoft.com. I think I just want an A, right? Yeah, okay, good. All right, so here I went to a server with a cache. This, this record is 2,899 seconds before it expires, and I have five IP addresses, all starting with 20. And see, the first one is 50, and the last one is 62. Now, if I just do the same query again, I reached the same server. That was 2899. Now it's 2881, just a few seconds later on the same server. If I do it again, 2871, 2869. I keep hitting the same server here, which is kind of screwy. When I, it must be something to do with being on campus. When I do it off campus, I hit different servers. And so I recorded that. Um, here, if you do it from off campus, you see, here I hit a server that's 2400, here I hit one that's 13, here I hit the 13 again, and notice the order of the records changes. This one has 35 on top, this one has 35 in the second place, this one has 35 in the bottom, so it randomizes these um, servers. So it, you're, you'll try to use the first server, and it keeps moving them in a round-robin way, so some of the traffic goes to one and some goes to another. That's a simple way to perform load balancing, so all the different servers get different requests. So it's not suspicious, and this means I'm contacting a cluster of DNS servers, and they have different cache timeouts. You can tell by the timeout. I'm hitting one server here and a different server there. So that's normal behavior of a normal domain that has many servers. Um, fast fluxing domain is when the TTL is down to just a few seconds, and this is what you do to um, evade detection and constantly keep updating it. So here's what Conficker, a famous worm, did. You'd look at it, you'd find this, there's a 60 seconds timeout for these domains, and when you ask a few seconds later, it's only gone down to 32, so this is gonna expire every minute, so they can move it all, the, all over the place, and the bots will find the new IP address. So you see it, it keeps changing. When the cache expires, it refreshes, and it gets all new IP addresses. They were all 65, now they're all here at 209. So they keep moving the servers from place to place to avoid detection. And then there's fast flux domains. Um, so you'll see here, the, uh, appear, this is what you might see if you have a lot of infected servers with a botnet at your company. They're all going to this control center, reforma.info, and they're all getting different IP addresses there um, for it. So sort of thing, you, uh, suspicious DNS traffic is often an easy way to detect a botnet infection. Um, then there's phantom domains, where you register a domain, and usually only for a brief period of time. There was a time when a lot of DNS registrars would actually let you use a domain for like a two or three day trial before they process your credit card. So you could use it this way for free, as long as you don't mind it getting canceled. And that was one way for bad guys to hide their traffic briefly on a server for free. Um, so one thing people do to detect suspicious domains is you find the domain registration date. And if the domain was just registered within the last couple days, that's very suspicious. Most people register a domain and they keep it for years. Um, all right. The WannaCry ransomware, I mentioned before, this was a, uh, caused hospitals all over Britain to go down and have to divert their surgeries and hurt people. But before it hit business time in America, it was turned off because 
in the ransomware itself, it had a domain name, and Marcus Hutchins found it. And he bought that domain. It hadn't been bought. And it turned out when that domain was active, it turned off the ransomware just by luck. So he was a hero that uh, saved American hospitals sort of by accident or his research into that botnet. And here's more. Now, the con picker worms had another way. They had a random, random generator, a pseudo-random generator, to create these apparently random domain names. And so it would make 50,000 new domains a day and hunt there for a controller, so the attacker would buy one of these and the worm would find it. And so um, Microsoft and other people that wanted to stop this, they tried to block them all, generating these and making sure they were all bought by somebody else to take over the botnet from the bad guys. This is a quite common thing researchers and defenders do, is take over a botnet by buying the domain names before the bad guy gets it, and now you control the bot. And then you can see who's infected and warn them, and sometimes even send commands through the bot to destroy itself. Although that's risky, it has been done, however. And the other thing is DNS changer. This was an attack where it would infect your local machine and change your DNS addresses. Remember I talked about before, you just configure DNS addresses in your IP configuration settings, and normally you send them to a legitimate server like Google or Cloudflare, but I could change them to an evil server I control, which I put false data in. So now you're using a unreliable server to resolve domains, and I can then make it resolve like your bank's domain to a fake bank website and things like that. Uh, so DNS changers um, is a recursive resolver, and uh, what you'll find, it's suspicious. It's not your ISP's DNS, it's not your company's official DNS, not a known public server. That's a clue that something funny is going on, and you, there'll be IP address blacklists. You can just Google an IP address, and you'll find threat intelligence agencies have reports of that address. So if it's known to be malicious, it's pretty easy to spot. And other clues, like it's in an unusual country that you really shouldn't be going to, things like that. Um, DNS tunneling is another issue. This is a way to sneak data off the network. If I hack your network and I start stealing stuff like passwords and private data, I have to sneak it out of the network. And one way to do it is hide it in DNS requests. So you'll have a request for just a long random character name at mycompany.com and then encoded in that name is data sneaking off your network. So there'll be a large amount of DNS requests. So here's what you'd see. A normal DNS requests, this is a plot of size against frequency, and normal DNS requests are really small, like under 100 bytes, because they're just saying, where's Yahoo, where's Google? But if you're infected, you'll have a bunch of really large requests going out up near the maximum of 512 bytes of these long domains um, that are not real domains. It's just a way to sneak data off the network. And then DOS attacks, you can flood the server with, unuse, with useless traffic. Um, and so to detect this, you just look for unexpected amounts of traffic, uh, large amounts of bits per second coming in, a large amount of requests per second. Uh, SINs are a common kind of flood because a SIN is somewhat expensive for a server to process, um, and so on. ICMP or UDP comes in too, just a large amount of traffic coming in. Um, these can all bring things down. All right, so let's do another Kahoot. And that would be 4B, which is here. All right. Hey, isn't tight? 817, 2104. everybody that's coming. All 
All right, so what kind of packets perform DNS poisoning? Those are replies. False replies are how you poison it. It's asking where something is and you send a false answer. That's how you poison a server. All right, if I dig evil.com and I get four IPs in a different order each time, what would that indicate? That's normal round-robin DNS. If you have several servers, you'll just rotate them and put a different one on top every time. That's how you just even out the balance. That's not an attack of any kind. That's normal behavior. All right. If I always see TTL values below 61, what does that indicate? That's fast flux. That's not normal. It's not necessarily malicious, but it's very unusual that anybody would do that unless they're up to no good. All right, what process creates a covert channel? Tunneling. Tunneling. A covert channel means you send data out without it being obvious that that data is being sent out. And that's DNS requests. DNS requests are generally not sending data out. They're asking for data to come in, but you hide data in the host name, so you're sneaking data out. We're going to create one. Right after this, I'll start the demos, because the first thing we have to do to get anything done today is punch through the City College firewall, so we should all learn how to do that. All right. All right, so what did Marcus Hutchins do to stop WannaCry? This is called sinkholing, when you create a server just to absorb traffic to get rid of it like the Ayanna Black Holes, that's what he did. He bought the domain, now the botnets that were hoping it would not be there were finding it, and just absorbing that traffic is what turned off the, uh, the botnet. Right, Nick. And Junk Food John, all right. And Sam, all right, good. All right. So I got those names. I'm going to stop this recording.